Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about my research into paraphrasing. Uh, and this is something that I've been working on since my own dissertation. So I've accrued a huge list of collaborators, including uh, Peter and Su Chen and many others. So uh, I want to give them full credit for the ideas. So just to start off, um, I like to illustrate what paraphrases are. So uh, paraphrases are alternative expressions that convey the same meaning. And we can talk about them at several different levels. So on the one hand, we have individual words like cup and mug that are synonyms or lexical paraphrases. We sometimes have multi-word phrases like his majesty's speech and the king's address uh, as paraphrases. Um, we also often will try to develop some sort of templomatic paraphrases, and sometimes those can encode a reordering. So x devours y is, uh, implies that y is eaten by x. Um, and then for some of this work in the talk today, we're going to uh, constrain those slots with a particular syntactic type. Um, and then, of course, you can also think about sentential paraphrases where you have whole uh, sentences or whole paragraphs conveying the same meaning but are worded differently. So paraphrases are potentially useful for a wide range of natural language processing applications. So in question answering, if we wanted to build a QA system off of Wikipedia and someone asks, when did California become a state? And the actual text of the Wikipedia article about California says, California joined the union in, then knowing that become a state and join the union are paraphrases of each other are necessary for answering that. Uh, in multi-document summarization, paraphrasing is useful in two ways. So first, we'd like to identify the repeated elements across the uh, documents that are authored by different people to pick out the things that are most salient to include in a shorter summary. And secondly, we'd like to identify those elements that mean the same thing so we don't accidentally repeat them and artificially lengthen the summary. Um, and you can imagine a whole range of applications in a variety of different NLP scenarios. So given that paraphrases are potentially so useful, uh, how do we get them? So like most of the rest of the field over the past few decades, we've been shifting towards data-driven methods. Um, and there's a really nice uh, review article in computational linguistics on data-driven paraphrasing methods by Nitin Mandati and Bonnie Dorr. Um, that breaks them down based on a number of different categories. And so I'll walk through examples from each of these different types of data. So the one that I'm particularly interested in are bilingual parallel corpora because I'm coming from a tradition in machine translation. Uh, so the first type of data are monolingual parallel corpora. So these were the things that Regina Barzale studied in her PhD thesis. So she took different English translations of the same classic French novels and then aligned them at a sentence by sentence level. And you can see that, that, that the different choices that the different translators made of that same text uh, results in different uh, lexical paraphrases. So we have glued to goes to fixed to, balanced in the air goes swinging in the air, um, heart rending cry, harrowing plea. So you get interesting variation in how people have chosen uh, to translate it. And these are sort of by definition paraphrases because they've got the same underlying meaning, meaning they're anchored in the same foreign language texts. And then the authors have just using their, used their own word choices in order to pick out how they're going to do the translation. So uh, Regina and uh, Kathy McEwen aligned the sentences across these texts and then uh, showed that you could even use very simple heuristics like identical surrounding substrings to pick out paraphrases. So burst into tears is a p potential paraphrase of cried because it's surrounded by Emma and he tried to. And similarly for comfort and console, they have identical surrounding substrings in these aligned sentence pairs. Um, so these are great because A, they're clearly paraphrases and B, uh, they not only give you these lexical paraphrases, but they have whole sentential units that might be useful for learning other sorts of transformations. Uh, the major drawback of these are they're relatively rare, um, and they might be limited to particular genres. So here, she, 
they were looking at classic French novels. Um, and there are other sources of these multiple translations, especially for creating uh, test data for statistical machine translation systems, where we'll often hire multiple translation agencies to translate the same set of Newswire articles multiple times to capture some of the allowable variation in translation. But both of those sources only amount to a small amount of data. So there's been other efforts at pulling out uh, sentences that mean the same thing. So there was a really neat effort at Microsoft Research looking at comparable Newswire stories. So stories published around the same dates about the same topics. And then they pulled out interesting sentence pairs like these, again, using a small set of heuristics, like saying the first sentence of an article often summarizes the article. So if you have two articles on the same topic, you could pull out their first sentences, and those are often good paraphrases of each other. And secondly, they pulled out sentence pairs that had low string edit distance. So the first one is good because it gives you more lexically diverse things, and the second one is a little bit limited in what sort of lexically diverse paraphrases might result from it. Um, so this uh, is nice because it's a step up from the monolingual parallel corpora, uh, but we can go even further and say, let's use raw monolingual texts, which is gonna be a superset of everything here. So there was really awesome work done by Zelig Harris at the University of Pennsylvania in the 50s where he had the distributional hypothesis which said, uh, if you consider a pair of words like optometrist and eye doctor, then we find as our corpus of utterance grows, these two tend to occur in very, very similar environments. Uh, and the uh, optometrist will occur in environments that lawyer does not. So we're able to, by virtue of looking at the environment in which words appear, say that A and B are potential synonyms uh, if they have almost identical environments and not if they don't. Uh, and there was a really awesome NLP effort that operationalized this distributional hypothesis called the DIRT system, discovering inference rules from text uh, by Patrick Pantel and Dekong Lin, where they looked at uh, defining what we meant by the context in which a word appears, and they operationalized it using dependency relationships. So they said that duty and responsibility are going to be paraphrases of each other because they're both modified by the same adjectives like additional duty, administrative duty, assumed duty, etc. And they're both tend to be the object of the same verbs. Uh, and so using that notion, you can define a vector space model that will draw these things together. And you can therefore define uh, similar environments to uh, be the thing that gets you paraphrases even without having this monolingual parallel text or these comparable sentence pairs. Um, so that's the past work on data-driven paraphrasing. And my research has really been on looking at paraphrase through the lens of machine translation. So uh, translation is somewhat similar to paraphrase in that it's something where we're rewriting a text to preserve meaning. But in translation, we're going from one language to another. Uh, and then paraphrasing might be viewed as translation within a single language. So we're doing similar sorts of transformations, but instead of going from French to English, we're just going from English to English. So I'm going to draw a lot of inspiration from statistical machine translation and reuse a whole range of things. So I'm gonna look at how we're, we can reuse the bilingual training data that we normally use to train statistical machine translation systems, how we can reuse the alignment algorithms for picking out what words are aligned across different languages, how we can use the models and parameter estimation, and even how we can use the decoding machinery which takes a model and produces the most probable translation of a given input uh, to generate interesting paraphrases. Um, so let's start with the training data. So in statistical machine translation, we again have these sentence-aligned parallel corpora, uh, but unlike what we've looked at so far, these are now in different languages. So we've got a French sentence aligned with an English sentence. And the great thing is that they're available in abundant quantities um, and uh, they provide a strong meaning equivalent signal, but of course they're in different languages. So the, uh, the insight that we had to try to pull out paraphrases is 
if we wanted to paraphrase a phrase like thrown into jail, we look at the aligned, at the word aligned sentence pairs and see what foreign language phrases it aligns to, and then look for other instances of that foreign language phrase and what it aligns back to. So essentially what we have is a bilingual pivoting method where we say that imprisoned is a potential paraphrase of thrown into jail because it shares a foreign language phrase. And again, uh, the nice thing about using this particular type of data is that we've got quite a range. Uh, so we've got uh, about a quarter of a billion words worth of bilingual parallel text between Chinese and English and Arabic and English that DARPA helpfully creates for us for the, their translation programs. Uh, I had a very nerdy hobby when I, where I tried to scrape every bilingual French-English web page I could find and had uh, probably the largest publicly available by text where I've got nearly a billion words worth of French paired with a billion words of English. And then we can also easily get many, many languages uh, from the European Union because they, uh, by law, publish in all of the official languages of the EU. Um, and so as a result, we can actually pivot over any of these foreign languages because we're interested in English paraphrases. So we're not only constrained to pivoting over a French sentence, we can also do a German sentence or an Arabic one. Um, and because we have such a large and diverse set of training data, we get a wide range of paraphrases. So for thrown into jail, we not only get imprisoned, but also arrested, detained, incarcerated, jailed, locked up, taken into custody, thrown into prison. And then we get some that are maybe not quite as good or have some sort of shift in syntactic category. And then because we're using automatic word alignments, often we'll get some things that are weird or just plain wrong. So we get things like uh, maltreated or owners, which are not clearly related to thrown into jail. Um, so to try to solve this problem, we defined a paraphrase probability where we'd like to say, what's the probability of uh, some paraphrase E2 given some input phrase E1. Um, and we can sum over all the foreign language phrases that we're using to pivot over. And we can uh, estimate that probability in terms of the probability of an English phrase given a foreign phrase and the probability of a foreign phrase given an English phrase. And those are nice because they're naturally calculated for us uh, through the statistical machine translation machinery. So we're just lifting those directly in order to compute this kind of probability. <clears throat> and those are often just estimated using maximum likelihood estimators. So we say in our parallel corpus, how often was the phrase military force aligned to a particular German phrase? And that gives us one of those probabilities. And then how long, how often was that, prob that German phrase uh, aligned with different English phrases? And that gives us the other probability. Uh, and then, of course, we're interested in all the languages, so uh, we just pivot over everything. Um, we also find that uh, we can improve the quality of the paraphrases by trying to constrain them to be the same syntactic type. So if we define the paraphrases only as the same syntactic category as the input phrase, then we'll eliminate a lot of the noise that we get from uh, the misalignments. And uh, I should have mentioned in the last slide, because we're pivoting over all these languages, we often overcome some of the problems of systematic misalignment within a single language by virtue of the fact that we're going over many different languages. Okay, so uh, I think these are pretty clearly an interesting way of extracting individual uh, synonyms and phrasal paraphrases from bytext, but uh, unclear question in my mind is, is it possible to generate full sentential paraphrases from this type of data, right? So um, we can get these smaller units because we can pivot over individual phrases, but we might be interested in more uh, sentential or structural transformations. And those seemed to be easy to acquire from the type of data that Regina Barzilay was looking at where she has full sentence pairs that are meaning equivalent, or that the Microsoft research guys were extracting in their comparable corpora data set. But it's definitely not obvious that we could learn this sort of transformation from Bitex. Um, so I'm now going to give you a five minute overview or less of how we're currently doing statistical machine translation. 
And the recent trend in statistical machine translation has been towards uh, integrating a lot of syntactic information into our systems. So whereas uh, when we originally were developing statistical machine translation, we took it at this, as this great virtue that we were language independent and didn't require any syntactic information. Uh, we've now dismissed that notion and actually decided that in order to get high quality grammatical output, we're actually going to have to pay attention to uh, syntactic information. So my research group develops an open source decoder for statistical machine translation called the Joshua system. Um, and as its representation, it uses synchronous context-free grammars, uh, which are great because they generate pairs of strings in correspondence, which means that we can uh, both generate the translations of words and phrases, but also do some of the reordering that we need to do for uh, languages that are divergent from each other. Um, so here's an example synchronous context-free grammar for the order to English language pair. So if you just ignored the English column, then you would get a normal context-free grammar. Um, and then in order to make it a synchronous context-free grammar, we're saying that every rule has to have uh, an identical set of non-terminal symbols, these noun phrases or these verb phrases, uh, on both the input side and the output side. But those non-terminal symbols can come in different orders. So Urdu is a post-positional language. So where in English we have to the store, in order you, in Urdu you have the store to, um, and it's also a verb final language. So in English where we have uh, a verb followed by its object prepositional phrase, in Urdu you put the object before the verb phrase. So when we represent translation in this way, then the process of translation is actually one of parsing. So we have an input Urdu sentence, uh, and then we analyze all of the terminal symbols. Um, and if we stopped there, then we would have the Urdu output, or the English output in Urdu order. So Hamad Ansari, vice president for nominated was. But as we apply the higher level reordering rules, we get the uh, postposition becoming a preposition. We get the main verb and the auxiliary verb inverting. And then we get the higher subject verb object order English in English coming from the subject object verb order in Urdu. Um, and then finally, when we reach the S symbol and it spans the entire sentence, that's our goal state and we're done. Uh, so under the hood, we're simultaneously entertaining hundreds of thousands of alternative translations and scoring each one with an associated set of feature functions or a probability. So when we reach the goal state, we'll output the one that's most probable given the model. So that's all I'm saying about translation. And so we can now adapt that same synchronous context-free grammar representation to the problem of paraphrasing. Uh, so we can take a pair of English and French rules where we've got the English possessive and see that they align to the same uh, French rule template. And then we get uh, a nice representation of the English possessive rule. So we get a noun phrase can either be written as uh, the car's windshield wiper or the windshield wiper of the car. Right? So we learn this general principle that you can do this sort of transformation in English that implies some reordering. And we learn that from the same data that we were looking at before. Uh, so in our uh, EMNLP paper about this, we delved through the um, transfer, the syntactic transformations that we learned in this fashion to try to find instances of these different English meaning-preserving syntactic transformation that we would hope to find. And we could find a lot of interesting ones. So we got various instantiations of the possessive rule. We got things like the dative shift. So uh, give uh, Peter the book or give the book to Peter. Um, uh, the system learned that adjectival or adverbial phrases uh, could move around a lot in English. Um, but for these particular expressions called verb particle expressions, you can often move the particle. So knock the mug over, knock over the mug. So that over gets moved around. Uh, we have things like reduced relatives, partitives, even some topicalization and passive constructions. So lots of interesting syntactic transformations that preserve meaning within English are discoverable in this fashion. Uh, 
Um, so uh, we can use these rules to perform monolingual translation, or what I like to call text-to-text -text generation. So the idea of text-to-text -text generation is just we want to preserve some meaning, uh, or we want to preserve the meaning of some input, but uh, subject it to some constraints. So there's lots of different fun text-to-text -text generation tasks. The one that I'll show you is uh, sentence compression, where you take some longer, longish input that you'd like to rewrite to be shorter so that you could tweet it uh, and just cut down the character count. Or you might think of the process of sentence simplification as one of text-to-text -text generation where you take some text but rewrite it to be more appropriate for uh, young children who are at a certain reading level. Or you might do something even more fanciful, like take something that's written in prose and trying to try to rewrite it as poetry by imposing a certain meter and rhyming scheme. Um, so the NSF doesn't want you to do that because they're afraid Congress will complain. Uh, so uh, I'll walk through the task of sentence compression just to give you a sense of what I mean by this sort of thing. So the goal again is to reduce the length of the sentence quantified either by the number of words or the, by the number of characters and then we'll define the compression ratio as the length of the shorter output divided by the length of the original longer input. And so we have some sentence like what my PhD students like to write and then we have some shorter version like uh, my revision. Um, and we can extract a paraphrase grammar in the same way that we had a synchronous context-free grammar for Urdu which encodes some of this notion of uh, rewriting to compress a sentence. So now we have some uh, longer sentence as input. And again, we apply rules that cover some of the terminal symbols and we get some uh, useful rewrites there. So you get things like cartoon rewriting shorter as comics or the word 12 rewriting as the numeral 12 or a phrase like the Islamic prophet rewriting as Muhammad. And then we can apply higher level rules like uh, this partitive construction where 12 of the cartoons goes to 12 comics. Uh, we get a really interesting verb phrase where we have no verb in this sentence. We get an adjectival uh, going to a noun phrase, which is doable in a lot of languages. Like Russian, wouldn't, you wouldn't have to use the copula R in that case. Um, and then we can have the uh, reduced relative. And finally, we can get a reordering rule like this active passive alternation. And we output the sentence, 12 comics insulting Muhammad caused riots. Uh, so that's the general notion of how we would like to apply these rules in order to have some effect like compression. So my claim is that this paraphrasing mechanism is suitable for uh, quite a range of text-to-text -text generation tasks and that we can reuse a lot of the statistical machine translation machinery uh, with the caveat that uh, we shouldn't just naively apply that machinery. Um, and instead we need to do some adaptation in order to get it to work. So I'll give you a little idea of what uh, adaptations we need and how I propose to do it. So, um, so instead of a naive application of these things, we're gonna do task specific adaptations of the development data that we normally use in statistical machine translation, the objective function uh, that guides our model to figure out what's actually good, uh, the set of features that underlie the model, and then something that doesn't normally happen in statistical machine translation, we can actually inject specific rules so that we know a priori happen in a particular type of transformation. So in statistical machine translation, normally we use this development data that I mentioned before, where we hire multiple translation agencies to translate the same set of foreign documents, uh, and then we use that to compute a blue score. And we hire the multiple agencies because there's not one exact translation that's correct. So unlike something like speech recognition, where you have a single authoritative transcription, in translation there's a lot of allowable variation that we'd like to accept. So uh, we hire a bunch of people and figure each one of them is gonna do it slightly different and we'll capture some of the allowable variation. So for compression, we can actually steal this data to create our compression development set. So we'll just pick out pairs of sentences from these multiple translations where one is long and one is short. 
and use that as our example development set to show the model. Here's examples of the types of transformations we'd like you to make. So these, this is a pair of sentences that were drawn from the same multiple translation set that we use for MT. And we can say, if we're targeting compression ratio of about 0.8, then that's a useful one. Um, next, we're going to adapt the objective function that we use to tune the parameters of our system. So uh, in machine translation, we use this metric called blue that IBM developed. Um, and blue is a, a precision-based metric. So it looks at all the n-gram matches of uh, your system's translated output against the translated references produced by humans. And you say, of your system's output, what fraction of the n-grams actually matched the references. Um, and because it's precision-based and doesn't have a definition of recall in it, you could potentially game the system by outputting a single high-frequency word. So if you output the word the, it would almost always be 100% correct. Or if you put just a period symbol, you'd almost always be correct. So um, in order to avoid that, uh, Blue introduces something called uh, a brevity penalty. So if your output is shorter than the references, then you only get a fraction of the total score. So uh, if you look at the um, output of your system versus the output of the references, and if you're less than the length of the references, then you multiply your score by a fraction, right? So, uh, so in blue, we have a brevity penalty, but that's actually the exact opposite of what we want when we're talking about compression, right? Because we want it to be shorter. Um, so my student, Yuri, came up with an adaptation of blue called Precy, uh, which has a corresponding verbosity penalty. So we look at a particular target compression ratio, and then if we're off in either direction, then we penalize the output. Uh, so next, the features that underlie the model. So in statistical machine translation, we have a definition of a phrase translation probability and a lexical translation probability. Uh, and those are typically what we use to quantify the goodness of the translation. Um, so we can also pull those out and just use the corresponding thing like the uh, paraphrase probability. Um, but we also would like to add in additional features that model the task that we're interested in. So we'll insert features that count the lengths of the output and the ratios of the input to the output. Uh, so for a rule like this, it's not only going to have a paraphrase probability, but it's also going to have uh, a set of corresponding counts and uh, compression ratios that help guide the model to picking rules that are shorter. So just on the objective function, Mm -hmm. Why do you want to penalize for being too short? Uh, so that's, again, this outcome of uh, not having a good recall metric. So uh, we don't want it to be too, too short, because then the model can get into this weird space where it's outputting almost nothing. Um, yeah, so but I agree that that's not Before perfect. The same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it's probably more sensible to also define a recall and then just set your uh, target compression ratio. Uh, any other questions at this point? All right, so uh, another difference uh, between statistical machine translation and these text-to-text -text generation tasks is we might be interested in augmenting our paraphrase grammar with rules that model the particular tasks that we're interested in. So. Uh, we don't typically insert rules into the statistical machine translation system. We only take those that are learned. Um, but in tasks like compression, we might say uh, insert rules where we know that adjectives are things that are more likely things that we would like to delete or uh, adverbs or similar. So we could insert rules. So for every adjective, we could rewrite it as the empty string, for instance. Um, and then there's another set of things that we can do in the paraphrase setting that we couldn't do in the translation setting, and that's due to the fact that we're operating in this monolingual condition. So in statistical machine translation, all of the features aside from the language model uh, are typically bilingually derived. Uh, but in text-to-text -text generation, we can add in a bunch of features that are inspired 
by vector space models or by DIRT or all these other techniques for extracting paraphrases that gives us additional information about the goodness of the rules. So we can calculate distributional similarities for every paraphrase rule in our grammar. Uh, and that hopefully gives us some sort of orthogonal signal to the goodness of that individual rule uh, that's different than what we get from the bytext. Um, and again, we can get even more data to inform our distributional similarity method. Uh, so um, so for the, the idea is really just to look at this kind of uh, distributional hypothesis that Zelig Harris had and create some representation for how similar a pair of words or paraphrases are by characterizing their context. And so we can then represent those contexts as a vector and then calculate some measure of geometric similarity like cosine to say how similar the words are. And that gives us some notion of substitutability. So this is great. Like it allows us to look for cup and mug, what sort of context they appear in. And they appear as a cup of coffee or a mug of coffee. Um, and so that's easy. Uh, similar for phrases, we can look for the sentences that each of the phrases occur in and count, count similar sort of surrounding n-grams. Um, but then when we get some of these syntactic patterns that may imply some reordering, it's a little less clear what we should do. So the trick that we did was to create a word alignment between the different elements in the sentence. So we recognize that these are the lexical items that are aligned, and then we just say, uh, take the average of the similarity of the lexical items and figure that the uh, similarity of noun phrase and noun phrase as a non-terminal symbol should be one. Um, and we can uh, compute similarity in a number of different ways. So we can look at n-gram similarity, we, where we look at how often words occur to the left or the right of the phrases, uh, and we can compute this over the large data sets like the Google n-grams. Um, or we can look at syntactic similarity where we look at dependency parses or other sorts of syntactic features that we can analyze once we've parsed a large volume of monolingual texts. So uh, for our experiments and for the resources that we're generating, we calculate this n-gram similarity using Google n-grams, which is based off of a trillion worth, worth of data. And then one of my students automatically parsed all of the GigaWord and created this automatically annotated GigaWord set, which is about 4 billion words worth of automatically parsed data that we can calculate uh, syntactic similarities. OK, so that's how we adapt the models. And so how well does it do? Uh, so since this is an NLP talk, I, I'm obliged to do some sort of evaluation and report some sort of number. So I'm just going to report one. Um, so we evaluated paraphrases on this text-to-text -text compression task. And we compared against a state-of-the-art system uh, de developed by Clark and Lapata, which won the EMNLP Best Paper Award uh, in the year that EMNLP was in Prague, 2007, I think. So it's a good system. Um, and then we did a human assessment, where we ranked the outputs of the different systems on a five-point scale for both how well they retained the meaning of the input sentences and then how grammatical the output was. Uh, so here's kind of the upper and lower bounds. So we took the multiple translation sets and used that uh, to create a high-end human compression. So again, we took the longest sentence and the shortest sentence, or the sentence that matched our target compression ratio. And people thought those were pretty great. Uh, we randomly deleted words to try to hit our target compression ratio. People thought those were pretty terrible. Uh, and then. Uh, here's where Clark and Lapata's integer linear program compression model falls. Uh, and then ours, although it's not specifically designed to do compression like theirs was, pretty much does the same. So we get uh, slightly better in the retention of meaning and slightly worse in the grammaticality of our output. And here's some examples of what the different outputs look like. So the original input sentence here is Hala speaks Arabic most of the time with their son, taking into consideration that he could speak English with others. Uh, and then the human compression is Hala speaks to her son mostly in Arabic as he can speak English to others. 
the Clark and Lapata one is Hala speaks Arabic most of the time, taking into consideration that he can speak English with others. So kind of crucially deleting the referent of he. Uh, and then our system uh, paraphrases, taking into consideration and pulls it down to considering. Yep. So, sorry, say one more time. How does this key scores factor into brevity of it? Like, if I got so, yeah, so that, that's a really great question. So uh, when you're evaluating the outputs of different compression systems, it's pretty crucial that you evaluate uh, outputs that are the same compression rate. So if you take the output of one system where it's very conservative and doesn't delete much, so let's say its compression ratio is only 0.9, versus a system that cuts out half the words and gets down to 0.5, it's a really unfair comparison. And there's a very strong tacking of the human judgments increasing as the compression ratio increases and the outputs are longer. Um, so here we just constrained all of the outputs to be the same compression ratio as each other. So we took the Lapata and Clark output and re-implemented the model and then it made sure that our system was outputting the same lengths. So it can choose different words that it's going to shorten. And theirs is mainly a deletion model and ours is mainly a substitution model. Um, so it chooses different things, but their, their ratios are going to be the same. Yeah, so that's a great point. Okay, so uh, that's how we do adaptation. So five easy steps. Uh, if you want to apply this machinery to your own text-to-text -text generation application, I recommend you collect some de development data that illustrates the type of text-to-text -text, uh, transformations that you want to do. Um, I suggest that you look at changing blue into something more sensible for your particular task, uh, that you add in features that help the model understand the task itself and that model that task. Uh, that you optionally augment the grammar with some task-specific information, um, and that you potentially can take advantage of the fact that you're operating within a single language and add in these other monolingual uh, signals. Okay, so I've got a few uh, resources that I can offer up to you. So one is this Joshua decoder that I mentioned earlier. So this has all the implements all the algorithms that you need in order to translate with these synchronous context-free grammars. Um, and you can download it from our joshuadecoder.org website. Um, if you're interested in learning more about machine translation, uh, I developed a class with Adam Lopez, Matt Post, who are both at Johns Hopkins. Adam has now moved uh, to University of Edinburgh, and Chris Dyer from Carnegie Mellon. And it's a fun project-based class where we have a series of homework assignments that all have the properties of uh, being open-ended research questions with no correct answer. So it's not like a problem set, it's actually a research task. But each of them are ones that we can objectively score the output of the student's system. So we can create a leaderboard and have fun competitions where they can keep track of how well they're doing compared to each other. So you can try out our assignments, they're pretty fun. Um, and then I also have this paraphrase database, which I've uh, given to Peter and which you can download from paraphrase.org. So it's got quite a few paraphrases. So it's a, a huge amount of paraphrases, which PPDB thinks is an enormous amount, a tremendous amount, a huge sum, an enormous number, a huge number, an awful lot or a massive amount, uh, and probably a hundred other alternate expressions. And if that's too much, we release it in six easy to use sizes from small to triple extra large. Uh, and these are sorted by a combination of the different scores that we have associated with each paraphrase. So roughly speaking, the small ought to be the highest precision paraphrases that we're most confident in, increasing towards higher recall. So we did a quick experiment where we sat down uh, my students and I sat down over beers and judged a bunch of paraphrases. And then we found that the human score uh, pretty well tracked with the paraphrase score in our database. So that means that uh, paraphrases that aren't very good, like expect and harbor, fall low in the human score and get scored uh, poorly by the paraphrase score. Um, but the ones that are scored higher and are better 
with human judgments like expect and hope are also automatically scored to be better. And then the nice thing is you can pick your own boundary and decide whether you want to operate on high precision paraphrases or whether you want uh, more recall. And you can pick your own point or you can choose one of our splits. Okay, so here's some examples that my student Yuri picked out. So the neat thing about the paraphrase database is it, we cover a huge range of language. So it's billions of words worth of text that we're extracting from and you get lots of interesting real world language in there. So we range anywhere from scientific abstracts to subtitles on movies. So um, if you're a non-native English speaker and you want to learn how to swear like a sailor, then just type in a swear word to PPDB and it'll help you out. All right, so uh, to, wrap, to wrap this up, so uh, we've done a lot of work on the extraction and representation of paraphrases. So uh, we've done a lot of work to try to extract to extend this bilingual pivoting method to also extract interesting meaning preserving syntactic transformations and then shown how we can uh, ins therefore reuse a lot of the machinery from statistical machine translation all the way down to the decoder to produce interesting text to text generation. Uh, and then we've looked at other ways that we can extend beyond the machine translation framework by incorporating all these other monolingual uh, signals. So just a quick peek at, peek at some of the other things that we're working on. So uh, we're currently working on three things. One that's been kind of a longer running thing that was inspired by Peter on domain adaptation for paraphrasing. Um, one that I'm just looking at now on looking at paraphrases that are uh, representative of different word senses of the input phrase. Uh, and then finally doing some uh, more nuanced view into what actually is in the paraphrase database. So we, we were really interested in uh, at adapting to your biology textbook. So we looked at different ways of extracting paraphrases where we, uh, instead of extracting from all of the bi-texts we had available to us, we tried to generate a model automatically that was more representative of the biology textbook and then only extract paraphrases from that subsample. So if we look at two subsamples of equal sizes, one that reflects the biology textbook and one that reflects the proceedings of the European Parliament, then you see interesting differences. So I've grayed out the words in common. And in Parliament, when we talk about the word divide, we often are talking about the divide between rich and poor. So we're talking about the gap between them or the gulf between them. Um, or we're talking about dividing up the wealth. Uh, and in biology, we use divide completely differently. It often is talking about cellular division. So we're talking about cells breaking, cells cleaving, cells fracturing. And interestingly, in biology, divide and multiply are perfectly good paraphrases of each other. And probably no other domain is this the case. Uh, so I'm also interested in trying to figure out how to do word sense in induction. So if you type bug into the paraphrase database, you get all these paraphrases. And you can see that they all probably make some sort of sense, uh, but they really depend on the particular word sense of the input phrase. So uh, I'm interested in thinking about how we can partition these automatically to know that these things group together. So currently it's just one sorted list where they come in random orders and they're not grouped into these uh, sense clusters. So my thought is instead of just looking at one hop off of uh, the word bug, we could also look at the second hop and compare the different paraphrases for each of these things and potentially look at either their distributions or if you visualize them at, at, as a graph, like which are the highly connected components and then from there be able to split them into groups that may be representative of the different word senses. Um, so finally, my uh, student Ellie is working on how do we adapt this paraphrase system to word sense. So now instead of trying to compress the sentence, what if we had a pair of sentences uh, that were given? So we've got some text uh, and some hypothesis and we want to find out what the correspondence is between them. Uh, we're thinking about whether we can use synchronous parsing, which is kind of the analog of translation uh, with the SCFGs. Uh, and other ways of doing the alignment between them. And then the really thing, 
interesting thing to me is trying to attach some semantic representation or some entailment relations to every entry in our paraphrase database. So we've got lots of things that are perfectly meaning equivalent, which is kind of what we've been implying all of these things are all along. Uh, but we've often got other things in there where a one directional entailment makes sense, but the other doesn't. So if we've got uh, medical illustrations, we don't want to paraphrase that as medical cartoons, right? But if we have the Peanuts cartoons, it's okay to say Peanuts illustration. Uh, similarly, we'd like to understand if we delete an element, what the directionality of the entailment is. We'd like to be able to model uh, things like negation or alternation with the goal of being able to do inference. So if we see something like riots in Greece, we can correctly conclude that uh, civil unrest happened in Europe, but not vice versa. So we're taking a lot of inspiration from this natural logic uh, that was developed by uh, uh, Chris Manning and his P PhD student, Bill McCartney, and we're trying to attach that to our paraphrase database. All right, so that's it. Uh, thank you from me uh, and from the paraphrase database.